afternoon. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I wanted to call this talk Cut the Crap, but I wasn't quite sure if I could use the C word. Um, so I'm going to give you some insight into actually what keeps me awake at night, and it's clutter. And I'm not talking about you've just come back from vacation and you've emptied your suitcase. I'm talking about clutter that lives with you. And we refer to this in design terms as visual uh, visual clutter, uh, visual noise. Um, and then what I want to point out to you all is that from the moment you wake up to the moment you fall asleep, you're engaging with so many products, from the toilet seat to your car interior to the clothes you put on. And all these moments of engagement with products can actually either strip you of dignity or they empower you. And I'm going to hopefully take you through a journey so by the end of this afternoon when you go home, you actually begin to challenge your own selected material landscape. Design is about experience. It's not about the product. And I think we're hearing this message over and over. So for designers, we have to understand what is the experience that our users really need. Often they're unaware of their needs, and we have to develop empathy with them so we can interpret and respond appropriately. The other thing I want to point out is that designers are not blood-sucking capitalists. We do have some morals. We want you to be more mindful. We want you to have fewer objects. We want those objects to grow all gracefully with you. We really think about emotional sustainability. I'm going to share three objects with you today. Two were basically car crashes and tap into how if somebody associates a brand with me, when they buy an object for me, it can go terribly wrong. And then I brought an object with you to show how um, certain objects resonate with me on a personal level because I didn't want it to all be negative. I wanted to not be ending to this. So good design is seamless. You know it when you see it. You know when two objects are having a conversation. These two are spooning. You know, they, they've been together all night. There's an intimacy there. You know that if you go up and interrupt them, you're breaking something beautiful. It's a moment. Whereas bad design is evil. You are not to blame when you go to push a door and it really should indicate pulp. Or you go to open basic food packaging and you break a nail, you curse, and then you decide to go out for dinner instead. These issues are irritating, but as we age, we develop disabilities. This can actually be the difference between living an independent life and becoming dependent on others. So when we see a disconnect between the user, the product, the environment, it can be very, very compelling. This is the Beckman Institute. Some of you may be familiar with the Beckman. This is um, a, somebody who is legally blind, full blindness, and he's trying to read the Braille, which is meant for him, underneath the Beckman sign, the Beckman Cafe sign. So legally, we have to have Braille. But in reality, this five foot two individual, and let's, let me show you the, the larger context of this problem. I had, to move, I had to move furniture so this chap could actually read the text in Braille. And when we consider how few people read Braille in the US, he's kind of unique, it was just for him. So this is a disconnect. And so while many of us may wander around and get incredibly bitter at the world at this point, designers are optimists. We have to envision what doesn't yet exist. So we look at this as a design opportunity. We live in a verbocentric culture. We put too much emphasis on the spoken word, yet we live life through our senses. And it's those senses as designers that we have to tap into. And it's very difficult to interpret how people feel about certain situations. And so as designers, we're almost immersed into unknowns, we explore, we're not proving hypothesis. And so it becomes very challenging. What we do acknowledge is that 
products that we purchase, the items that we're wearing, they're not just serving utilitarian needs. We have needs beyond those, and we call them superfunctional needs. And as branders, as uh, people involved in new product development, it is critical that you respond or acknowledge and in a very respectful way ensure that the products that you're developing satisfy these needs. Trust me, if you design a product that is incredibly utilitarian, but the person that you give it to doesn't relate to the product, it doesn't resonate, it doesn't communicate, it will be abandoned, it will be misused, and it will be left in the closet. And I have some examples for you. When many, many people say to me they're pure functionalists, and I look at them as they're saying this, they've got product in their hair, they're wearing a designer watch, you know, they've taken a lot of time on how they look, um, it's not quite the truth, it's not authentic, but it's their reality. This is Abraham Lincoln's toilet, and this gives you some insight into the type of photographs I take when I travel. So this is a great man's toilet. We know his bottom's been on this piece of wood, you know, and I give respect for that. But however, I would prefer a $3,000 toilet, and this is the Cola hat box. I loved it so much I put it in the Craner Art Museum for people to view. I wanted people to see the objects of everyday living as sculptural, bring beauty, and it's not just about function. Then what does the future look like when we're going to have our hair cut? You know, you can already have your body scanned so those Levi jeans fit you perfectly. Customization, uh, repurposing, this is in the here and the now. But I'm not going to pursue this with you because I want to get to the troubling question of how does your material landscape affect you? So. If your material landscape is not suitable for you, and we go through many stages in our lives, well, then it can begin to erode your confidence, your ability to operate. It takes you longer to do things. If you've ever lost your car keys as you're about to leave for a meeting, you will know how impaired and incapable you become. That panic. So, this is what I want you to ask yourselves when you go home. And unwanted birthday gifts sum it up beautifully. We all must have them. And they really, it, well, it's, it's, it's so sad. And I'm going to share two examples with you. I'm born at Christmas, so it's Christmas Eve, Christmas Day the next day. So I'm often used to, oh, here's your Christmas present. Oh, it's your birthday. Oh, here's Christmas and birthday presents. So I'm used to that scenario. Then put on top of that that I'm a twin. So throughout my whole life, I've experienced quarter presents, okay? <laughs> and yes, I'm still bitter. So, whenever, this, uh, these two presents are one of the first two presents I received that were for me, and I didn't have to share. So, the first present, I love it, it's got Alessi. We go back to branding. So a good friend had bought me this Alessi present and I thought, this is wonderful, Alessi, this is classy design. Yes, she got it, she knows who I am. This is called Mr. Suicide. It was in a little cardboard coffin with daisies up the side. So in England, we say pushing up the daisies. I don't know if that translates in the US. But this is so when you're soaking in the bath with your bubbles and your glass of wine, this poor little chap is fighting for his life. He's, he's in effect trying to commit suicide. Now, this is such a disconnect with who I am. My friend was clearly seduced by the, the word Alessi on the packaging. So this was an expensive gift. It was purchased with love. She was adding to my design collection. This was a good thing. However, it didn't hit the spot. And so this product cannot stay in my material landscape because of the message that it has. This was the second present with Alessi on the back. This is called Mr. Cold. What happens with Mr. Cold is you fill Mr. Cold with shampoo or hand soap, and then you press his head down, and through his swollen nasal cavities, you get gobs of shampoo or hand wash. 
remember, these were bought with love. These are expensive gifts. These are designer. They're a lessee. These are unwanted gifts. And I'm sharing with you, body and soul here, what it's like not to get a good gift or not to get something that feels wrong. Mr. Cole, Mr. Suicide. And I've never even been able to share this with my friend. Maybe until now, when she sees this. <laughs> so, on a happy note, I've brought something that I want to share with you that I have already bonded with. And because of that, I've got an emotional, sustained relationship. And before I show you, Playfulness is core. We're adults, but really we're just grown-up children. And I think if you can build playfulness into your material landscape, it helps with creativity. It helps with relaxing. It helps us nourish. It's like you've got to have a good diet of food. You've got to have a good diet of um, materials on show in your home environment. So what I brought for you today, he's called a swear bear. Now, I would love to tell you that I've had this bear since I was three, and my grandmother gave it to me, and, you know, it means so much, but I can't. I got this this Christmas. I love this little creature, and he's a swear bear. And when you press his tummy, he comes out with 19 swear words. <laughs> which are so disgusting, I cannot share him with you right now <laughs> because my career would be over. However, over coffee or later, you can all have a squeeze. But this is to show you how, as adults, we still need objects that give pleasure and joy. And there's nothing more wonderful than him standing up in, in my home knowing that he's that naughty. If I go over and engage with him, he will swear for me. So, to conclude, me and the swear bear would love for you to go home today. And if there are objects that don't give pleasure, don't give delight, don't enhance, cut the crap. Your life is too precious. Thank you.